Hello and welcome to bmclounge.com. My name is Shoeb and today we are looking into PM101 project management 101 session. This is your gateway to the world of project management. So if you're someone who's new, who's just starting off or is interested in starting off a career in project management, this is the session for you. Now, typically I take up these sessions um, in, in certain avenues in certain on certain stages, uh, but I thought of sharing this uh, on this YouTube channel as well. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. We are all about project management and we are all about the PMP certification. So what can you expect out of this long lasting session, right? So what can you expect? Why should you watch this session? The first thing, like I said earlier, this is going to be your gateway into the world of project management. So we will talk about a lot of basics of project management. This is going to be an introduction session. Again, if you are already aware of the basics of project management and once you go through the initial slides, the initial uh, part of the session, you will already know the basics of project management. Then we are going to take a step ahead. We are going to take a step deeper into the world of project management and we'll know some more stuff about project management, which will be much better than the than just the basics. So if you are into project management, if you're starting off your career in project management, or if you're thinking about uh, getting into the career, into the domain of project management, then this session is definitely going to be helpful for you. Another point is this is also going to introduce you to the PMP courseware. Now PMP, if you're not aware, is it is the gold standard certification in the field of project management. It is offered by Project Management Institute USA. PMP stands for Project Management Professional. This channel is all about PMP. This channel is all about project management. So I'd like to repeat, subscribe if you haven't done so already. All right, let's move on. So a brief about me, although I cover this slide only when I'm on stage in much more detail and give it some time. But in this video, I'd like to just share that I got my PMP in 2016. And I'd like to remind you to check out the website pmclounge.com, which is your number one free PMP resource. And subscribe to the channel youtube.com slash pmclounge if you haven't done so already. So this is going to be the agenda for the session. A lot of hard work has gone into meticulously designing this agenda like i said earlier a lot of work has gone in just to ensure that we cover first the basics then we take a step ahead and then we also introduce you to the pmp courseware all right so let's get started let's get ahead let's take you to your first step in the world of project management what is a project? Now, first thing to note is that a project is temporary. It is something which is temporary. It has a definite start and end date. So there is going to be a start date and an end date. And that is why a project is something which is temporary, thereby having a defined scope and resources. So there's only so much you can do between a definite start and end date, right? So that is the reason why you should have a defined scope and you should have defined resources that can be consumed within this definite start and end date. So that is what project is. 101, very basic, that is what project is. Now, a project is also unique. That means there is nothing like this which has been done earlier. That is the definition of unique right there. A project is also supposed to be unique. It is not routine everyday operational work. Now this is what we mean when we say a project is unique. Nothing like that has been done before. A project is unique in the sense that it is not your everyday operational work, which has a repetitive output. It is a specific set of activities designed to accomplish a well-defined unique objective. So there you have the textbook definition of a project. It is a specific set of activities 
which are designed to accomplished to accomplish a well defined unique objective so there is a unique objective which is well defined and that is what we are setting out to achieve as part of a project now you may recognize these world famous projects the pyramids creating the pyramids that was a project the wall of china the great wall of china right construction of the great wall of china was a project similarly construction of the taj mahal was also a project so these are some of the world famous projects but then projects are not just construction work these are also projects having a man reach the moon right that is a project designing a car this is also a project or creating a software package this is also a project so like i said projects are not just construction work projects can be anything that have a unique output nothing like this was done before nothing a car like this was never designed before a software like this was never be made before so all of these projects had a unique output so let's do a little bit of practice here setting up a mobile phone factory this is a project assembling thousands of mobile phones every day what do you think is that a project no sir that is not a project and there is a specific name for this it is an operation putting together a team of research analysts to come up with a design and a prototype of a waterproof phone within 6 months just read this again putting together a team of research analysts so you have put together a team they these are resources to come up with a design and a prototype so this is your well defined output of a waterproof phone again this is part of the output within 6 months so this is the time frame that you have what is this of course this is a project this basically satisfies all the conditions that we read about project earlier manufacturing thousands of those waterproof phones using the design blueprint so this project is now complete you have come up with the design you have come up with the prototype of how to kind of come up with that project right how to make that project now how to make that mobile phone how can you manufacture that you have the design you have the prototype with you now what you are doing basically is you are manufacturing thousands of those waterproof phones using the design blueprint using the output of the previous project so now manufacturing thousands of these phones is that a project no sir that is not a project it is an operation so i hope this was clear i hope you were able to understand what a project is and what is the difference between a project and an operation number 2 is where do projects come from so how do we come up with these projects that's a good question right that's a good place to start so if there is a change in technology or a new technology has come up right then projects may emerge from them so gps was when gps came to the mobile phones there were a lot of projects a lot of apps that were developed to make use of the gps so new technology brought new projects competitive forces if you are in the market and there are forces in your competition of course they will uh, you may have to come up with new projects to stay ahead of the competition material issues right you might be using certain materials for certain projects which are no longer used political changes market demand economic changes are all changes related to the out outside of your office the real world changes right customer requests if a customer wants something well you have to deliver stakeholder demands legal requirements oh so sometimes there could be legal issues with your uh, 
you know your product or anything that you offer and that may uh, you know you may have to come up with new projects to deal with those uh, legal requirements an example that comes to mind was the samsung note phone which uh, kind of was blasting <laughs> with the customers right i'm not sure what phone was that was that note or something but yeah so that phone started blasting and customers started reporting it news media started covering it so legally you cannot sell a phone that is a potential bomb so you have to come up with a new project and that project was to how you are going to deal with the media how you are going to deal with the customers and how you are going to phase out those phones so that uh, you know you kind of stop the manufacturing of those phones but how do you deal with all of this that is a potential project a legal requirement has led to that project business process improvements strategic opportunities business needs social needs environmental considerations also lead to new projects so these are some of the avenues some of the pointers that uh, you know are basically initiating projects these are some of the pointers that give birth to projects project constraints now this is something very very useful and this is something which i'd like you to pay attention to the classic triple constraint triangle so we have something which is known as triple constraint triangle uh, which is also known as iron triangle as well so these are project constraints you have time you have scope you have cost and then you have quality as well so these are project constraints and these are put together as form of a triangle because if you decrease the time let's say you decrease the time of a project what is going to happen with this triangle is the scope may remain the same but the cost is going to rise so this area this line is going to be larger than the previous line this line and which means your cost has increased if you have decreased the time of the project and what has happened to quality quality is the entire area so quality is also decreasing why because quality is defined by the entire area of the triangle of the triple constraint triangle so the quality if you see in the previous triangle the quality was quite high the area was quite large now the area is smaller and that is why quality is decreasing so this is the reason why we call time cost scope and quality a part of the triple constraint triangle because a change in any of these a change in cost a change in scope project scope a change in the project time or project schedule is going to impact the other constraints of project so this is something which you as a project manager need to take care of and that is why we introduced this topic the project constraints to note like i just said these constraints are interrelated so a strain on one of the core constraints will affect one or more of the other constraints as well this is also known as iron triangle of project management like i mentioned earlier so this is the triple constraint triangle also known as iron iron triangle of project management and this is something which is very very important for you as a student of project management this should be the first thing that you should be studying after you know uh, what the project management is what what project is now if you go deeper like i said we'll go a step deeper from the basics you will realize that it is not a triangle anymore there are some other constraints as well we talked about time we talked about cost we talked about scope we also talked about quality but then what about risk what about resources if you are decreasing the time for a project if you are decreasing you know uh, the time required to achieve a project it is possible that the cost is going to increase right the other constraints are going to have an impact but what about resources 
what about the materials that you need to achieve that project right if it is a construction project and it was supposed to finish in six months now you say you need that in five months it is possible that the cost is going to increase it is possible that the quality may decrease but it is also possible that the resources you need the manpower that you need is also going to increase right so that is the reason why these are some more project constraints that you need to take care of what about risk the risk is also in going to increase in the same example that i just talked about isn't there a risk if you are finishing a construction project which is supposed to take six months you are finishing that in five months what are some of the risks our you know folks that work in the construction area are going to tell you well that there is going to be a risk because there is certain time that you need after a construction is done for let's say watering the area for let's say i, I am not sure about the exact uh, civil uh, civic uh, civil engineering definition or civil engineering word for it but yes the risk is going to increase if you're going to reduce the time i'm 100 percent sure about that so these are some more project constraints that you need to consider as a project manager now let's talk about how do you define project success so you we, we just discussed the project constraints and now if you have delivered a project if you're done with the project if you're done with the construction that you were talking about how do you know that the project that you delivered was a successful project or not so we just talked about constraints and those are some of the areas that define the success of a project as well so number one is going to be schedule you need to continually evaluate your progress as you go as a project manager you need to make sure that the schedule that you have six months construction project you need to make sure to continually check with the project team after one month where are you what is our progress will we be able to finish the remaining tasks in the remaining five months at the end of second month you need to go ahead and check with the project team again where do we stand will we be able to complete the project in the next four months so this is something that you as a project manager need to do and you need to work out the slippages in a timely manner so if there is any slippage if you are supposed to have completed a certain part of the construction project by the end of three months but you're not able to do so how do you handle those slippages that again is a part and a job of a project manager an example here is from the bangalore metro phase one project this was supposed to complete in march 2010 but after missing at least nine subsequent publicly announced deadlines the phase one metro was finally open to public in october 2011 so there was a, a basically slippage in schedule from march 2010 to october 2011 so schedule is something which is very important and it defines the success of your project if you are delivering your project on schedule then it is quite possible that you can say that yours was a successful project but delivering the project on schedule is that the only way you define a successful project of course not there are four more let's look at all of them point b is going to be cost and i'd agree with you if you look at this point and say well this should actually rank first in the list to help with the schedule what about the cost right what about the dollars what about the money and of course it could rank actually first in this list how do you hold and control cost is you evaluate just like schedule you need to evaluate the amount that your project has already spent you need to do that in a timely manner you can also look forward and reforecast to compare with the original budget so let's say the schedule was six months for the construction project that we were talking about in the previous slide and let's say the uh, the scope for the sake of uh, simplicity let's say the uh, cost that you had forecast in the beginning of the project was sixty thousand us dollars so at the end of three months 
you should ideally be at 30,000 US dollars, right? And of course, this is just for the sake of simplicity. So let's say at the end of three months, if you are, if you have already spent 40,000 US dollars and you are left with three months and 20,000 US dollars, then you need to do a refocast and you need to compare that with the original budget and you need to make sure that your project falls in place or you need to make sure that extra funds are arranged. But at the first place, you need to ensure that you don't waste money, you don't spend more than you're supposed to. Cost overrun is going to be fatal for your project. My, mark my words on that. So in 2006, let's take a look at an example. So in 2006, 33 kilometer of Bangalore Metro phase one work had a baseline cost of 6,395 crores, which is 63.95 billion Indian rupees. Due to delays and extension of Metro work to 42.3 kilometer, here's, here's something important to note. The original scope of this project was 33 kilometer, right? Construction was to be done for 33 kilometer, but later the scope was changed. The scope changed to 42.3 kilometer, right? A change of almost a little less than 10 kilometers here. But just look at the cost that has changed. 6,395 crores to the final cost of 14,405 crores, right? So this project basically had uh, is a major case of cost overrun but this also had a change in scope uh, but if you see the cost has has actually changed and it is it, the or it is now costing more than twice of the original budget with a change of just less than 10 kilometers Number three, without any guesses, is quality. And if you see, if you recall the iron triangle that we talked about, cost is here, schedule is here, and now quality is also here. So these three define whether your project was a success or not. Again, there are two more factors that define which we will look into after this slide. So quality, how do you maintain quality for your project? Again, just like cost and just like schedule, quality is something which you need to review timely and at the end of each project phase as well. So what is a project phase? This is something we will be discussing later on in this session. So keep that in mind. Let's park that aside for now. But understand the fact that you need to review as a project manager, you need to review quality timely. Now, how do you review quality? And that is where quality standards come into the picture, right? In your six months pro uh, project for construction, right? You need to have quality standards with you. You need to understand what is the quality standard for a two month old project, right? Let's take another example for the sake of simplicity. Let's try to understand from the perspective of a web development project. Let's say you are creating a website. A well-defined quality standard would mean that the home page should load in 0.05 seconds. First thing is, this is a very well-defined quality standard that the project manager and the project team is aware of, and they should be working towards achieving this quality standard. And the second thing is, it should be accessible. The quality standards, which are de defined, right, uh, by the end customer, by the project sponsor, or whoever has designed or defined the quality standards, they these standards should be easily accessible by the project team. It should not be locked away somewhere on another uh, country, in another country where the project team cannot reach out for it, right? They should be easily accessible. Now, some example here is uh, the food is not good here. That movie is boring. This phone is really bad. That car is a work of art. Bangalore Metro is pretty crowded. If you see the quality standards in these examples are not well defined, not good. What do you mean by not good? What is the definition of good? Similarly, the movie is boring. How boring is it? What is the definition of boring? A 
movie being you know a movie you call a movie boring it may be boring for one person but it could not be boring for the another person right so the quality standards are very subjective in these examples and they should be well defined these quality standards are not well defined the phone is really bad this is something very personal you may say that windows phones are really bad i may tend to think the opposite i may feel that windows phone are really good so we need to define quality standards and that is why uh, quality is important that is why quality should be reviewed timely and standards should be defined this is an important uh, factor to determine whether your project was successful or not another point is stakeholders satisfaction now i have a separate section on stakeholders as well this is uh, one of the important topic for your pmp preparation as well so i have taken a, a brief section uh, in this session itself for stakeholders so we'll talk about stakeholders uh, in further details as well later on in this session but this is also something which defines how successful your project was so you may see a lot of surveys in your daily life right facebook puts out a survey or let's say your employer puts out a survey or let's say a political party or a government puts out a survey they are all there for a reason they just like our previous slides when we did a timely check on schedule we did a timely check on cost we did a timely check on quality a survey is also a timely check with the stakeholders level of satisfaction so even qualitative checks during the course of the project is worth it instead of somehow working through the project and completing it with only the project manager being happy so while you are working on the project while you were working on that six months construction project at the end of two months or at the end of three months ask your project team ask the person who's paying for that project and take their feedback even if it is qualitative right you don't have to ask them to give you uh, marks out of 10 on 10 different uh, topics right you don't have to do that even qualitative checks is everything good or is everything not good qualitative checks like these are also going to help you make sure that the stakeholders are satisfied with your project an example here is the presence of a high pressure petroleum pipeline forced the Bangalore Metro route to airport to be altered. The Bangalore Mangalore petroleum pipeline has become an important stakeholder. So while the Bangalore Metro route was being planned, nobody went and took a survey or nobody went and took, uh, you know, a qualitative check as well with the bangalore mangalore petroleum pipeline this organization nobody checked with them whether they were okay with the route that the bangalore metro had finalized for the airport what happened was they finalized the route and then they had to alter it because this stakeholder was never surveyed this stakeholder was never asked if they were okay with the route if they were okay with the plan and they became a very important stakeholder because you cannot have a metro route in the vicinity of a high pressure petroleum pipeline right so this is why stakeholder satisfaction is important this is why doing a check with the stakeholders is important when you are in the course of delivering your project finally the last point is alignment to business case so there is a business case for every project a project needs to make business sense and what is the business sense that the project is going to make is written in the business case document so how aligned was your project to that business case document right cost schedule quality are just one part of the puzzle did your project meet the original benefits it set out for and these benefits are defined in the business case document so do the problems that led to the project being conceived still exist are you working on something nobody wants so that six months construction project that we were talking about 
was actually being uh, was actually a house being built for someone who was paying for it but we came to know at the end of four months that the person paying for the project that the person paying for that construction of the house is actually moving to a different country permanently does that mean he wants that house now maybe not maybe the the problem that the project was going to solve has does not even exist anymore right so at that time for you as a project manager you need to do a check on this as well whether your project is still aligned to the business case or not what if people find shared cabs a better more convenient and cheaper alternative to metro if you are the project manager working on the bangalore metro and you find within the course of delivering your project itself that the people are finding shared cabs as a better and more convenient and even cheaper alternative to metro are you going to go ahead and still deliver your project are you going to still go ahead and deliver the bangalore metro that you had promised that you are that you were working on maybe or maybe not because the original business case the original problem that metro was going to solve has already been solved so these were the five factors that define after you're done with your project these five factors define whether your project was a success or not now that we have talked about constraints now that we have talked about how and you can say that a project was successful let's talk about project management and i have specifically put this point here because now it will make much more sense and now it will be much easier for you to grasp what project management is project management is the application of knowledge skills methods experience tools and techniques on project activities to meet the project objectives so you do know from the definition of project that it is a set of activities so you are as a project manager applying knowledge skills methods experience tools and techniques to make sure that these activities meet the project objectives and you already know how a project is going to be called successful so you need to make sure that you apply all these good things to meet and to satisfy those conditions as well and that is what project management is in a nutshell developing a new website or a software of course that is a project relief effort as a result of a natural disaster is also a project that you can manage construction of a building or a bridge are all examples of a project that requires project management now business leaders understand that project management is a function within the organization nobody else is going to come in and manage your projects so this is a function within the organization and that is why business leaders hire individuals that are specifically trained in this discipline and they are known as project managers to handle organizations project management needs so this is the reason why business leaders hire project managers because they know that there are specialized people with specialized knowledge right they, they, these people are specifically trained in the application of knowledge skills methods experience tools and techniques and they are known as project managers so they should be hired to do the project management job in an organization now just above project is something known as program and just above program is something known as portfolio let's talk about programs and portfolios so programs are commonly defined as a group of related projects this is important related projects that provide certain benefits when managed together so 
in our six months construction project let's say you are basically trying to construct four units together so managing those four units as a program managing those four projects as a program may be uh, beneficial because resources could actually be shared between those four projects right so that is a program managing the development of all e-commerce projects together can be a program so let's say you were designing an e-commerce website and your company designs many e-commerce websites so developing all those e-commerce websites managing that as a program and having a program manager look over this program is going to be beneficial for sure so here's an equation that is typically used and you will find in certain texts where program is equals to sub programs plus projects and sub projects what is a portfolio now portfolios are not just a group of programs but can also include projects that do not align with any program so this is important portfolios of course uh, from common sense you may make out that portfolio would be a group of programs of course it is that but it can also include projects as well that do not align with any program they are so unique there is no other project like that with within your organization so managing all types of website development related projects and programs can be a portfolio while managing all mobile apps related projects and programs can be another portfolio so this is an example of two different portfolios here so here's the equation that you may find in certain texts portfolio is equals to sub portfolios plus programs and sub programs plus projects and sub projects so that is portfolio for you so you you have project then you have programs and then you have portfolios so this slide is going to help you understand project program and portfolio diagrammatically as well if you can see this entire thing is one portfolio and it has two programs one and this is the second prog program right each program have certain projects which are similar in nature this program has three projects which are similar in nature and then you've got these two programs which are now a part of one portfolio so this is one portfolio and this is how uh, you can understand projects programs and portfolios diagrammatically you need to uh, understand here one other point that just like project management we have a certification called pmp project management professional from pmi pmi offers two other certifications as well pgmp which is program management professional and pfmp which is portfolio management professional so these three all these three certifications are provided by pmi just like you see project managers you may see program managers and portfolio managers in certain organizations as well if you are interested into pmp and want to know how you can clear it in 50 days go on to this link pmclounge.com slash pmp study plan this is our free plan uh, thousands of people have downloaded and have been benefited by it so go ahead download it now let's do a quick agenda check so we have covered six items already here and we are now left with six more items we've talked about project we've talked about the constraints of the project we've talked about what project management is now let's try to understand who is a project manager again like i said this agenda has been meticulously designed so that you can easily grasp the upcoming concepts so let's talk about project manager from definition perspective the project manager is the person assigned by the performing organization to lead the team that is responsible for achieving the project objectives so there is a performing organization which is basically delivering the project and the project manager is going to lead the team lead a team 
and that team is responsible for achieving the project objectives so the project manager he does project management he or she does project management with the project team not alone right he manages that team he leads that team but there are other managers as well which you may find in your organization and many other organizations functional manager so functional manager focuses on providing management oversight for a functional or business unit now your project may require several teams from several different functions those teams or people from those teams may report to the functional manager right so you have a functional manager in the picture here then you have operations manager as well operations managers are responsible for ensuring that business operations are efficient so these are three kind of managers you will typically find in every organization you may require resources human resources from functional areas as well as operational areas and that is why you need to be good friends with the functional manager as well as operations manager so there is a very famous talent triangle which is published by pmi this is pmi uh, pmi stuff here so what are the talents that a project manager should have we already know who the project manager is we already know uh, that he needs to deal he may or may not need to deal with functional manager as well as operations manager there's certain talents that the project manager should have number one is strategic and business management which means business oriented skills which applies to all certifications that pmi offers right so you've got benefits management and realization business acumen business models and structures competitive analysis customer relationship and satisfaction industry knowledge legal and leg regulatory compliance market awareness operational functions like finance and marketing strategic planning analysis alignment so these are some of the skills from strategic and business management domain that the project manager should have then domain expertise is something which is certification specific which is uh, specific to the certification offered by pmi here but as a project manager you should have technical knowledge as well something like agile practices so agile is now a part of pmp scope pmp courseware itself so agile practices is something you should know data modeling and gathering earned value management this is something again part of project management uh, professional courseware itself governance of all three project program and portfolio life cycle management performance management requirements management and traceability risk management schedule management scope management time budget and cost estimation don't be scared if you're uh, kind of worried with all these terminologies we will discuss at least some of these terminologies later in this session when we dive deeper into the pmp courseware and finally in the pmi talent triangle you have leadership skills so competency in guiding and mo motivating this also applies to all the certifications that pmi offer brainstorming coaching and mentoring conflict management emotional intelligence influencing interpersonal skills listening negotiation problem solving team building basically strategic and business management leadership and technical are the kind of skills that you as a project manager should have now let's talk about organizational structure we talked about how you may have to deal with functional manager and operational manager different kinds of managers in your uh, organization how is your organization structured also kind of impacts and influences how much you need to deal with these different managers so let's look at organizational structures determination of the appropriate organizational structure type is a result of the study of 
trade-offs between two key variables. Number one is organizational structure types available for use and number two how to optimize them for a given organization. So what is the organizational structure of your organization? This is dependent on these two key variables. What are the available types of organizational structure that your organization can use? And number two is how can that organizational structure be optimized for your given organization? There is no one size fits all structure for any given organization. The final structure is unique due to the numerous variables which need to be considered. So now let's look at the organizational structure types which are available. So these are the four organizational structure types. Functional organization, matrix organization, projectized organization, composite organization which is also known as hybrid organization. So your organization is going to be one of these four or it might be tailored to fit your own organization right let's understand these four in detail so that you know how much you as a project manager need to deal with the functional manager or the other managers in the organization so the first kind of organizational structure is functional organization now this is where the project resources or your project team members are going to be working in silos and they are going to report to the respective functional managers so how does this work this works by having project team members that report to their own respective functional managers be a part of your project team so if you need let's say coders from three different skill sets you need java coders you need c plus plus coders and you need let's say dot net coders all three are going to report to their respective functional manager a functional manager is going to have 10 java coders and he's going to assign two or three as per your project requirement to your project those coders are going to be reporting to the respective functional manager they are not reporting to you so this basically impacts and influences how you should be talking to your functional manager and how friendly you should be with the functional manager because your project team is basically reporting to functional managers not to you so functional manager here in functional organizations they have all the authority the project manager here is only an expediter you can only expedite stuff the resources they don't report to you you can uh, you basically have to influence a lot to be able to get your work done the second kind of organization is matrix organization and matrix organization itself has three different kinds of uh, organizational structure that an organization can follow the first is known as weak matrix organization structure this is where the project manager has certain authority in the previous functional organization that we saw the project manager did not have any authority but here he has certain authority he's not just an expediter but he can coordinate stuff he is more of a coordinator the functional manager has higher authority and resources report to both so in the previous example in the previous slide in the previous topic of functional organization the project resources reported to the functional manager they did not report to you but in a weak matrix organization the resources are going to report to you as well as the functional manager the second kind of matrix organization structure is balanced metric organization what this means is the pm and the fm which means the project manager as well as the functional manager they share the same level of authority and resources again report to both but here you as a project manager have almost as much authority as the functional manager does this is a balanced matrix organization and finally you have a strong matrix organization this is where the project manager has higher authority 
resources still report to both but project delivery is most important so the functional manager cannot take away his or her resources because of uh, any xyz reasons because the delivery of the project that they are assigned to is most important and that takes precedence over any functional activity that the functional organize the functional manager might want the resources to do and might be looking for taking away those resources but he or she cannot do though and then you have projectized organizations what do projectized organization mean is the project manager has the highest authority here so you are the boss here you as the project manager are the boss teams are organized around projects so the teams the project teams right they are organized around projects they are not organized around functions this is something which is important to note here resources have no home after project completion what this means is if you need java developers the organization is going to hire java developers after your project is done those java developers will not have a project to work on so they may be acquired by a different project or they may be asked to leave the organization of course projectized organization you will find them only on very large engagement projects projects that span around more than let's say three years those kind of projects will have projectized organization an example that we talked about in previous slides was the bangalore metro work that is where projectized organization is going to shine because that is a huge project and the resources may not have a home per se or may not have work per se after the project is complete but then if there's any other uh, metro construction work in any other city of course they will be part of that project they can apply for that project or they will be acquired by that project team so this is how projectized organization work and finally you have composite or hybrid organization now this is basically a combination of all the three organization structures that we just looked into functional matrix and projectized so composite organization is going to be a mixture of all these three now a good question here would be well how does this organization really work how can you mix all these three organizational structures into one so let's address that question so within an organization there could be certain projects that are being managed following the balanced matrix organization structure while others could be following the projectized organization structure so you see in the same organization a project may be following the balanced approach and the other may be following the projectized approach a new project may pop up where it is beneficial for the team to follow the functional organization structure right so here you see in the same organization different projects are following different organizational structures and that is the very definition of the composite or hybrid organization structure the organization is using all organizational structures and whichever is beneficial in whichever project they are going ahead with it so that is a composite organization uh, composite organizational or hybrid organizational structure let me know in the comments which organizational structure does your organization follow because almost all modern organizations specifically the software uh, companies they follow the composite organization structure now before we deal with this topic project management office pmo let me ask you a question we just talked about functional managers and how we have functional teams you know developers that belong to the java team report to a java functional manager right so there's a team where do the team of project managers report to the team of project managers might just report into this department which is known as project management office pmo 
Now I say might because it is possible that project managers will have a separate team in certain organizations and they don't report to PMO. In certain organizations they may and that is why there are different types of PMOs which we are going to look into now. First up, PMO is a group or department that defines and maintains standards for project management within the organization. So this is important. They define and they maintain as well the standards for project management. So who should be doing this? Who should be the members of the PMO to be able to do so? Of course, project managers, right? So that is why I say a team of project managers might make up the PMO. But in certain organization, there could be a different team and they, the, the members of that team may not actively manage projects, but they would simply define and maintain the standards of project management within that organization. The PMO strives to standardize and introduce economies of reputation. Now, this is important. This point is important. Economies of reputation in the execution of projects. So let's take an example of call center setup project. Let's say you are an IT infrastructure project manager. You are going to deliver 200 seats for a call center setup. So what all infrastructure do you need? You need Wi-Fi, you need LAN connection, you need phones, whatever infrastructure that you need, right? Switches, wireless APs, everything. That is something that you are going to need and deliver as part of the project, right? The call center setup project. Now let's say your next project is also a call center setup project. Now can you take advantage of your previous project experience here? Of course you can. And that is where economies of reputation comes into the picture. If PMO takes certain documents from your previous project and keeps it in a central repository so that every project manager who is going to deliver a call center project can look into those documents, can take reference from those documents and be able to deliver the project easily. That is what is known as economies of reputation and that is something that PMO strives to achieve. So they want to standardize the and introduce economies of reputation. They want to maintain such documents. They want to standardize the the project management uh, discipline in an organization so that different project managers can make use of economies of reputation. Now there are three different types of PMO actually. The first one is a supportive PMO. This type of PMO will basically provide templates. So like I said in my previous slide in the call center uh, project, right? In that example project, there you may have certain documents that you would have created which needs to be repeated for other call center projects. Those documents can be used as templates. They can be used as templates for future call center projects. So these templates are something that PMO will keep with them. PMO will, uh, uh, they are going to publish them in a central repository or store with themselves so that the PMs for similar call center project can use those templates, right? To manage their project and to carry out with their project management activities. The second kind of PMO is controlling PMO. So in addition to whatever the supportive PMOs do, controlling PMOs can audit a project to ensure the processes prescribed by them are being followed. So we just talked about how PMO describes the process, right? The standards for project management discipline in your organization. So members of the PMO can also come in and audit your project to make sure that you are following the standards that they have prescribed for your organization. And finally, you have directive PMOs. 
and these are the kind of PMOs that actually assigns project managers to projects and PMs might be reporting directly to the PMO. So this is the kind of PMO which we initially talked about in the introduction of this uh, of this topic where we said that PMO could actually be a team of project managers. A directive PMO is just that. It is a team of project managers and project managers are assigned to projects through this directive PMO. Let's take a look into some practice questions here. PMO meets the project manager every once in a while to go over the project documents to ensure compliance. What kind of PMO is this? This is controlling PMO. PMO audits the project status at regular intervals to ensure reporting integrity. Again, this is controlling PMO. Project managers reaches project manager reaches out to the PMO for a template of change log. So what kind of PMO is this? This is supportive PMO. This is providing templates. PMO shares the organization's knowledge base and lessons learned for the project manager to use. What kind of PMO is this? Again, this is supportive PMO. You are assigned a project to work on by the PMO. What kind of PMO is this? This is directive PMO. You report to this PMO. Before the project can move from design to coding, the PMO ensures that all the prescribed design processes were followed. So PMO here is ensuring that the prescribed processes by them, whether they were followed or not, this is a controlling PMO. All right, so we talked about stakeholders in one of the topics previously, where we talked about the factors that define the project success cost, quality, schedule, stakeholder satisfaction and alignment to business case. That is where I said that we will go over stakeholders as well. Although stakeholders itself is a pretty big area to cover. So we are only going to introduce it here because we talked about it in the factors that define project success. All right, so anyone who will be affected by the outcome of the project is a stakeholder. This is a very important definition and this is going to kind of make sure that you don't fall into the confusion of who a stakeholder is. It basically says anyone who will be affected by the outcome of the project. So they are a stakeholder. Remember we took an example of uh, the Bangalore Mangalore pipeline. They were affected by the outcome of the Bangalore Metro project. Right? So they were a stakeholder, an important stakeholder. Project manager identifies all stakeholders and manages their expectations. Again, alignment to uh, not just alignment, but stakeholder satisfaction, which was one of the important factors that determine project success. So you as a project manager, you need to identify all these stakeholders and you need to manage their expectations, something which was not done in that Bangalore Metro project we just talked about. Remember that there can be negative stakeholders. Now, this is where the problem comes in. There can be negative stakeholders. They are negatively impacted by the outcome of your project. Bangalore, Mangalore pipeline, that organization was negatively impacted by the Bangalore Metro project, right? So they were actually negative stakeholders and it can be tricky. It can become tricky for a project manager to manage negative stakeholders. So three things that you need to remember about stakeholders, right? This can be a bit of an antithesis of what we just talked about uh, in the previous slides about stakeholders satisfaction, but you need to understand that not all stakeholders have the same power or impact, right? They may not have the same power, or the same impact on the outcome of your project. Not all stakeholders will always be satisfied. And this is important, right? We just talked about how 
stakeholder satisfaction is an important factor in determining whether your project was a success or not but then not all stakeholders will always be satisfied so this is something that you need to live with this is something that you need to understand and accept as a project manager that 100% of your stakeholders will not be satisfied with the way you deliver your project. Does that mean none of the project can ever be called a success? Of course not. People understand that there are negative stakeholders and uh, they are negatively impacted by the outcome of your project. So they may not be satisfied always and that is why they don't have to be. So not all stakeholders will always be satisfied and they don't have to be. But you as a project manager, you need to do a lot of stuff to make sure that stakeholders are satisfied by and large and you need to make sure that you identify all the stakeholders. Like I said, there's a large area to cover in the stakeholder management uh, domain and there's a separate knowledge area itself for stakeholder in your PMP courseware. But I just wanted to introduce this topic here because we talked about stakeholders in in the previous slides. OK, a quick reminder here before we move ahead, if you're looking for PMP book recommendations, if you are preparing for PMP and want to know what books to read, you can go over to pmclounge.com slash resources. That is where we have listed our favorite books for PMP preparation. A quick agenda check here. So we have covered 10 points already and we are down to the final two. This is where we will be going much deeper into the PMP courseware. We will be talking about project management lifecycle and its types and we'll be talking about the project management processes, specifically the five process groups and the kind of tasks that are expected out of project managers in these process groups. All right. Let's get ahead. So let's talk about project management life cycle. Now the project management life cycle, it basically comprises of the stages or phases that a project typically goes through. Remember we mentioned phases in one of our previous slides where we were talking about checking quality timely. And that is where I said that you should check for quality at uh, at the end of each phase as well if possible and so this is where the phases of the project comes through so each project essentially has four phases so you've got four phases for every project initiation planning execution and closure so these are the four project phases that each project goes through so you should ideally be checking for quality in all these four phases of course quality is just an example that i'm taking because i talked about it in the previous slides there are several different tasks that you as a project manager should be doing for each phase and we will be going over it in the next slides there is one more phase which is monitoring and controlling this is one such activity which is common to all the phases so you as a project manager are doing this activity doing the monitoring and controlling while the project slides or goes through all these four phases so this is how the cycle looks like we just talked about how there are four phases initiation planning execution and closing and then there is monitoring and controlling which is common to all the four phases so let's talk about the types of project management life cycle there is a predictive life cycle which you might be aware of as a waterfall life cycle or the waterfall model that kind of life cycle, that kind of model is known as predictive life cycle. Then there is iterative and incremental life cycle. And you have adaptive life cycle, which is also popularly known as agile. So we will be looking into all these three types of project management life cycles. Let's get started. So the first one is predictive life cycle, which I like I previously mentioned is also known as waterfall model or a fully plan driven life cycle. Now the project takes a phase by phase approach 
whereby the work on each phase is completed before moving on to the next phase. So we just talked about how there are different phases for each project, right? You've got initiation, you've got planning, you've got execution, and then you've got closure, right? Each phase, the work for each phase, each of these phases will be 100% complete. So if your project is in the initiation phase, the, in, the tasks involved in the initia, initiation phase should be 100% complete before you can move your project to the planning phase, right? This is the main idea behind the waterfall model or the predictive life cycle. So all requirements must be signed off before development can begin. This is a classic example, right? You first gather requirements and then you start the development in a software project. So all the requirements must be gathered. Your requirements document must be signed off before you can start the development for those requirements. In the end, the outcome is the final product. So after you're through with the closing phase of the project, your outcome is basically the final product. Then you have iterative and incremental life cycle. So here the project team can start working on a single set of requirements once they are signed off instead of waiting for entire requirements to be freezed. So what we are doing here is we are not waiting for the 100% of requirements to be closed before beginning the development. If let's say a total of 20 requirements are expected in the project, five of them are complete and five of them are marked as complete as well as signed off by all the stakeholders, everyone involved you can go ahead and begin the coding for those five. You need not wait for the remaining 15 to be complete and signed off by everyone before you begin coding. So this is, of course, saving a lot of time here, right? The outcome is partial product that increments as we move further. So let's say you moved ahead and you started coding for those five requirements. You were done with the coding for those five requirements while the 15 requirements, the remaining 15 requirements were not yet signed off. Even the requirement number six was also not signed off. So what is the outcome here? The outcome is a partial product and it will have increments as we move further. Last one is adaptive life cycle or change driven life cycle, also known as agile. So just like the waterfall model, the project will take phase by phase approach, but multiple times. So the phase by phase approach is going to be followed, but it will be done multiple times. Each iteration will generate a deliverable or a set of deliverables, right? So at each iteration, since unlike the previous cycle that we talked about, iterative and incremental, here, the requirements should be frozen, right? So not all requirements may be frozen, but at least for one iteration, the requirements should be frozen so that you have a shippable product at the end, right? So each iteration is going to generate a deliverable, a deliverable that can be shipped. And that is why this is different from the previous slide, because the previous slide didn't mention that you should have a deliverable a shippable deliverable it may be a partial increment itself while here in agile you should have a shippable deliverable at the end of each iteration also the outcome could be an instance of the end product this is also important right it could be an instance of the end product which can be improved in further iteration so you may be delivering a beta of a software itself in the first iteration and then second iteration will have the final product, the final outcome. The last topic here in this session is going to be the project management processes, the different project management processes. Now, there are five process groups. Again, this is part of the PMP courseware, guys. So there are five process groups in the PMP courseware, initiating, planning, executing, monitoring and controlling and closing. Remember, these are the phases that we just talked about. So these are process groups in the PMP courseware. 
and then there are 10 knowledge areas that cuts across these process groups the knowledge areas are integration scope schedule cost quality resource communications risk procurement and stakeholder so remember we talked about some of these in the project constraints itself we talked about stakeholder as well right that is where I said that stakeholder is a big area in itself because it is a large knowledge area in itself when it comes to PMP courseware. Now, this is how the process groups and the knowledge areas interact. How do you read this PGKA mapping? We call it PGKA mapping because PG stands for process groups. KA stands for knowledge areas. We just said that there are five process groups and there are 10 knowledge areas. And then these, when they cut across, the intersection is all the processes. And as of PMBOK edition six, you have 49 total processes. So in the project integration management knowledge area, you have these processes across the process groups. Right. So this is how you are going to read the PGKA mapping table. Initiating process group is in the initiating process group in the integration management knowledge area has just one process, which is develop project charter. And when you read the PMP courseware, you are going to read about the develop project charter process. What are the inputs you need? What is the output of this process? What are the tools and techniques you need to develop the project charter? And that is the study which you're going to do for all these processes, which is essentially the PMP courseware. Now, in the later slides, in the remaining slides of this session, we are going to talk about certain tasks that you as a project manager would be doing as part of these process groups right these five process groups what are the tasks that you as a project manager should be doing that is what we are going to discuss we will not be going into detail of each process because then that is going to become a five day training session all right let's go ahead so initiating process group is the first process group in the list as you can see towards your right the, in the PGKA mapping, you have two processes in the initiating process group. One is develop project charter and the other is identify stakeholders. Let's look at some of the tasks that you as a project manager would be performing as part of the initiating process group. First is you're going to perform project assessment. Now this is going to be based upon available information that you have, the lessons learned from the previous projects. Lessons learned from previous projects you can always get from your PMO, right? And meetings with relevant stakeholders in order to support the evaluation of the feasibility of new products or services within the given assumptions and or constraints. Identify key deliverables based on the business requirements in order to manage customer expectations and direct the achievement of project goals. Perform stakeholder analysis using appropriate tools and techniques in order to align expectations and gain support for the project. Identify high level risks. You can also identify the high level assumptions, constraints based on the current environment in which the project is working, organizational factors, historical data and expert judgment in order to propose an implementation strategy. You'll have to develop project charter and you need to participate in the development of the project charter by compiling and analyzing gathered information in order to ensure project stakeholders are in agreement on its elements. Project charter, by the way, is a document and that is why the next point is obtain the approval for the project charter, right? It is a document that is being prepared. So you need to obtain the uh, approval for project charter you need to do that from the sponsor a sponsor is the person who's uh, sponsoring the project offering you money for the project in order to formalize the so when you obtain the approval for the project charter you basically formalize the authority assigned to the project manager and you gain commitment and acceptance for the project from the different resources 
You need to conduct benefit analysis with relevant stakeholders to validate project alignment with organizational strategy and the expected business value of the project as well. You need to inform the stakeholders once your project charter is approved. So you need to inform them that the project charter is approved so that this is going to ensure common understanding of the key deliverables, project milestones, roles and responsibilities of the stakeholders, right? All of that at a high level is mentioned in the project charter. So these are some of the tasks, some of the activities that you need to perform as part of the initiating process group. Let's move to planning. So planning first we before we talk about the tasks required in planning, you can see the planning process group is pretty populated right in terms of the number of processes you have here a lot of planning processes. So that is why planning is definitely important and there are a lot of tasks that you need to do as a project manager in the planning process group. Let's start with review and assess detailed project requirements. You will ha also have to do so for the constraints and the assumptions that you came up with based on the project charter lessons learned and by using requirement gathering techniques in order to establish detailed project deliverables. So your project charter is already uh, done in the initiating process group. So here you are doing a review and assessment of the requirements, constraints, assumptions, everything that you have mentioned in the charter. Then you develop a scope management plan based on the approved project scope and using scope management techniques in order to define, maintain and manage the scope of the project. So scope again, one of the uh, constraints. Remember the triple constraint triangle that we talked about. So it is important. Then you develop the cost management plan as well. This is based on the project scope, schedule, resources, approved project charter and other information using estimation techniques in order to manage project costs. Again, cost is important. You need to have a cost management plan. Then you need to develop the project schedule. This will be based on the approved project deliverables and milestones, scope of the project and resource management plans in order to manage timely completion of the project. Then before we move ahead, I'd like to remind you that scope, cost, schedule are all part of the iron triangle that we have already discussed. And that is why management plans for these are extremely, extremely important. The next is you need to develop a resource management plan as well. So you will define the roles and responsibilities of the project team members in order to create a project organizational structure. So an organizational structure just for your project, right? And provide you, you can also provide guidance regarding how resources will be assigned and managed throughout the project resource was one of the other constraints project constraints that we talked about right when we talked about six project constraints that is where resource came into the picture another important part of uh, planning process group is to develop communications management plan so this will be again based on your projects organizational structure itself and what are the stakeholder requirements in order to define and manage the flow of the project information? So important stakeholders will require more frequent communications, right? Project st stakeholders, which are not so important, which do not have a larger role or larger impact on the project will have lesser communication requirements. The procurement management plan that is also something that you need to develop because that is also something which is going to be important. This will be based on the project scope budget and schedule in order to ensure that the required required project resources will be available. Then you have a quality management plan. By the way, are you noticing that there is a plan for each knowledge area here? We are talking about scope management plan. We are talking about schedule management plan. We're talking about cost management plan, quality management plan. We've also talked about resource management plan, communications management plan. And now you're talking about a quality management plan again. So the quality management plan. So this is something that you need to develop and this is going to you also need to define the quality standards. Remember, we took an example of how quality standards are important, right? So for your project, what the quality standards are going to be. This is something that you will define as part of 
the quality management plan that we are talking about here right so uh, the uh, what are the scope of your project what are the risk what are the requirements all of these right uh, are uh, you need to consider when you are defining the quality standards next is uh, develop the change management plan so again for this you need to define how uh, the changes if there are any changes in one of the examples we saw how 33 kilometer metro line was changed to 43.2 kilometer when that changed uh, when that change occurred right what happened was the project manager would have looked into his change management plan so this change management plan basically defines how changes will be addressed and controlled in order to track and manage the change throughout the project some more uh, tasks for planning process group are uh, risk management so you need to plan for risk management as well again this is going to be uh, how you plan for risk is you're going to develop the risk management plan you need to identify analyze and you need to prioritize what are the project risks you need to create a risk register as well and you need to define what are your risk response strategies in case those risks which you are uh, kind of working on looking into identifying if they materialize what are your risk response strategies right then you will have the project management plan you need to present that to the relevant stakeholders so you've basically prepared a plan for all of these you've got scope management plan schedule management plan cost management plan you've got quality management plan resource management plan communications management plan you've got the risk management plan that we just saw you've got procurement management plan you've got stakeholder management you've got plans for everything and the combination for all this is known as a project management plan so you need to present this project management plan to the relevant stakeholders then you need to conduct kickoff meeting you need to communicate that the project has started off and what are the key milestones of your project right you need to inform uh, you know the stakeholders uh, with the relevant information and finally there's a stakeholder management plan something that we missed before we talked about the project management plan so stakeholder management plan again you need to analyze needs interests and potential impact of all these stakeholders right in order to effectively manage stakeholder expectation and engage them in the project decisions so stakeholder management plan again an important part of the project management plan itself the next one is executing process group and if you notice the executing process group actually has less number of processes as compared to the planning process group and this again uh, signifies the importance of planning there's a saying that goes by a minute spent in planning is going to save 10 minutes in execution and as a project manager you need to make sure that you spend a lot of time in planning so that execution is smooth let's look into some of the tasks that you would do as a project manager in the executing process group the first is you need to acquire and manage the project resources this will be based on your resource management plan so the resource management plan and your procurement management plan so what are the resources that you need to deliver your project so you are going to acquire and manage those resources next is you need to manage task execution again this will be based on your project management plan then you need to implement the quality management plan so this is quality management you already have the quality management plan you already have your standards quality standards written in the quality management plan so you need to make use of the appropriate tools and techniques and you need to ensure that the work which is performed is in accordance with the quality standards that you have defined then you need to implement approved changes and if there are any corrective actions you need to implement them then you also need to implement approved actions if there are any so you follow the risk management plan here and if any risk materializes then you need to implement the approved actions based on your risk management plan you need to manage the flow of information this will be part of your communications management plan you need to manage the flow of information uh, and you need to uh, keep your stakeholders engaged as well in the process right 
and you need to of course manage the stakeholder relationships you need to follow the stakeholder management plan in order to receive the continued support and manage the expectations of the stakeholders so basically in executing you are making use of all the plans that you have previously formulated so the next is monitoring and controlling process group so remember we talked about how monitoring and controlling is one such activity that the project manager does throughout the project life cycle so what are some of the tasks of the monitoring and controlling process group but before that if you see the number of processes in the monitoring and controlling process group is actually more than the number of processes in the execution process group which means a project manager's job is a lot of project managers job is in addition to planning is also monitoring and controlling the entire project work so that is why there you see a lot of processes actually uh, the processes here cut across all the knowledge areas of uh, project management so that is why you have work in all knowledge areas in the monitoring and controlling process group so some of the tasks for project manager are you need to measure the project performance so you need to use all the tools and techniques available to you you need to identify and quantify any variances and you need to take corrective actions if required manage changes to the project you need to follow the change management plan to do so and you need to make sure that the project goals are aligned with the business needs by managing changes to the project you need to verify that project deliverables conform to the quality standards again this is where the quality management plan will come into use and you need to use other tools and techniques to meet the project requirements and the business needs monitor and assess risk again you need to uh, determine whether the exposure has changed and you need to evaluate the effectiveness of the response strategies which you had formulated in the risk management plan right here's your risk management plan so in the risk management plan you had formulated certain risk response strategies in case a risk materializes so again you need to monitor and assess risk and you need to also check the effectiveness of your risk response strategies in order to manage the risks and the opportunities if any on the project you need to review the issue log so there's an issue log which contains all the issues of your project you need to update that as well if necessary and you need to determine if you need to take any corrective actions based on the issue log as well right you need to capture analyze and manage lessons learned if there are any lessons learned on your project you need to do that throughout the project not just at the end of the project and you need to use the lessons learned management techniques in order to enable continuous improvement so if you are looking for some of the lessons learned management techniques you can always reach out to your pmo and finally you need to monitor the procurement activities in your procurement management plan this is where we are talking about so you need to monitor uh, the procurement management activities and you need to make sure that the procurement management plan is being followed compliance are in place with the project objectives finally you have the closing process group and there is only one process in the closing process group which is close project or phase and what are some of the tasks that you as a project manager would do in the closing process group so number one is you will obtain the final acceptance of the project deliverable so you will obtain the final acceptance your project is done who will give this acceptance of course the relevant stakeholders they will be confirming and they will be giving their acceptance based on the project scope and the deliverables that you will be providing to them you need to transfer the ownership of deliverables to the assigned stakeholders in accordance with the project plan in order to facilitate the project closure of course you will obtain the financial legal and administrative closure you will use generally accepted practices and policies to do so th these practices and policies will be available with your pmo again so you can check with them and you will communicate the formal project closure and ensure the transfer of liabilities right so this is where 
the project manager's job ends and uh, the support team's job begins so you need to transfer the liability to the uh, respective support team you need to prepare and share the final project report this is according to the communications management plan so communications management plan will have details on this and you will be uh, kind of sharing this final project report with the folks mentioned in the communications management plan according to your communications management plan and you will be documenting and you will be conveying the project performance uh, this is going to assist of course in your project evaluation next you are going to collate the lessons learned remember we talked about lessons learned in the previous slide and monitoring and controlling so those lessons learned which you have been uh, kind of documenting throughout the life of the project you will collate all of them and you will conduct a comprehensive project review in order to update the organization's knowledge base of course organization's knowledge base something which uh, could be uh, coming under the purview of the pmo you will archive the project documents and materials uh, using generally accepted practices again this will be uh, from your pmo in order to comply with statutory requirements and for potential use in the future projects and the audits finally you will obtain feedback from relevant stakeholders you will use uh, appropriate tools and techniques for it and based on your stakeholder management plan is uh, when is how you are going to obtain the feedback and you will evaluate their satisfaction so uh, the stakeholder satisfaction is of course important uh, factor to determine the project success and uh, like i mentioned in one of the previous slides that not all stakeholders <laughs> will be happy with your project but again those are some of the tasks that you would do in your closing process group so with that we come to an end of this session i hope you enjoyed it do hit the like button if you found this helpful and subscribe to this channel we are all about project management and pmp there are loads of helpful articles and videos on this channel as well as on our website pmclounge.com so don't forget to check out the website pmclounge.com it is our number one free pmp resource thank you and have a nice day